Hello, my name is Jupiter Hadley, and let me introduce you to the unofficial Game Maker Meetup, a monthly meetup event where we have talks around the many aspects of game development in general, as well as with Game Maker Studio, along with casual discussions and socializing with game developers. The meetup is organized and run in our spare time by Quang DX of Asobi Tech, Juju Adams, and myself, Jupiter Hadley. More info can be found on Twitter at GMM Meetup or Facebook on the unofficial Game Maker Meetup group. Here's one of our wonderful talks. Next. So I'm going to start with Andy. Sure. And he's going to talk about level design in Super Mario Bros. Yeah. And maybe make me play it as well. Yeah. Andy Lemon. Hey, cheers. So this is just a, just a little talk on um, deconstructing Super Mario Bros. Looking at some of the ideas, or at least some of the things I've thought about whilst playing Super Mario Bros. since I was about probably about seven years old. Uh, so I've been playing it a long time and I still play it because it's a fantastic game. And it's a game we should all pay attention to when it comes to good level design and good characterization. So here's a little quote from Shigeru Miyamoto. What if everything you see is more than what you see? The person next to you is a warrior and the space that appears empty is a secret door to another world. What if something appears that shouldn't? You should either dismiss it or, or accept that there is much more to the world than you think. Perhaps it really is a doorway and if you choose to go inside, you'll find many unexpected things. That's a quote from a very, very imaginative man. And when you actually start really digging into how Super Mario Brothers works and where it came from, you really start to realize just how much thought and passion went into the design of this game. Today, we're mostly talking about the first level because it's, I think, a work of unparalleled genius in terms of level design. So let's first of all just talk about the genesis and concept and character of, of Mario. So let's look at the Super Mario Brothers family tree. And I'm just printing it out on the board here. And what you can see is, is that right at the beginning of the design process, Nintendo really wanted to make a Popeye game. They really wanted to make a Popeye game, but it didn't happen. There was a Popeye film that came out, 80, 81, that they really wanted to tie in with to create an arcade title. Unfortunately, it fell through. And the concepts from that game, as far as I'm concerned, are what led to the development of Donkey Kong. And there's a lot of commonality between Popeye and the world of Mario and Donkey Kong, which we'll look at in a minute. But as you can see, Super Mario Brothers is actually probably, let's say, the uh, one, two, three, the fourth game to feature Mario. So things changed. It's not working. Oh, there, there you go. So how did we get to the Mario we know and love from Super Mario Brothers? Let's take a look at some story and character elements. Let's look at Popeye. So here's Popeye, and here's Olive Oil, and here's Bluto, and here's Popeye fighting Pluto for olive oil. Here's Donkey Kong. <laughs> Here's Mario. There's Pauline. And there's Donkey Kong. And here's Super Mario Brothers that we all know and love. So obviously the, the, the love triangle trope was something that Miyamoto really seized upon when he was um, thinking of designing Super Mario as a game. So if things had turned out differently, we might have had Super Popeye. And what happens to Popeye when he eats spinach? Gets big and strong. What happens when you drop a can of spinach? It rolls along the floor. These are things that, you know, commonality and parallels that lots of people don't spot. However, I'm obsessed with both Popeye and Mario. So <laughs> this is why I get to these strange conclusions. So let's look at some of the gameplay changes that occurred over time. So if we look at get the, the old diagram back up here, we can see how Mario as a character changed over time. So here we can see Mario, or Jumpman as he was called, dodges barrels and dies if he falls a long way. So actually if you fall a long way down the screen in the original um, Donkey Kong, you die. But lots of people don't remember that. Uh, he can only destroy enemies with a hammer. And then if you go to Mario Brothers the arcade, Mario destroys enemies from below with a fist pump up into the air, and you have to go and kick the shells once they fall over. It's also the first game, Mario Brothers, to feature the inertia that we're so familiar with 
from Super Mario Brothers. Another genius piece of design. The fact that the character has real weight and skids and doesn't come to a complete stop when you press the controller. This was not something that you saw a lot back then when this game was created. And then when we get to the Super Mario Brothers on the Nintendo Entertainment System, you can see that Mario finally gets the dash and jump mechanic nailed down and the inertia that we're all familiar with. So what did Super Mario Brothers do that was so different? So let's talk about first impressions of the game. I can tell you about when I first saw Super Mario Brothers. That was in 1987, I think, at a branch of Debenhams. And I was bunking off school with my mate. And we went into Debenhams and we saw a kiosk. And in the kiosk was a Nintendo and it had been set up to play Super Mario Brothers on a little CRT screen. It was like a unit. And the first thing we saw was the title screen. What's different about Super Mario Brothers title screen than title screens of the time? Let's look at some title screens from the time that Mario came out. What do you notice about these title screens? They're very black. They're very static. Now, what do you notice about Super Mario Brothers title screen? What's interesting about Super Mario Brothers title screen that makes it different from other games at the time? Let's just take a look. Let's leave it. Look what happens. And it will move. What's lovely about the title screen to Super Mario Brothers is that the title screen is the game and the game is the title screen. It's very meta. So as a kid, the first thing you saw wasn't this black screen and just the name of a game if it was on demo mode. You saw the game play itself and then it would reset and it would go back to the title screen reminding you of the title of the game. And then it would, in a few seconds, <laughs> go back to moving again. So it's a very interesting thing. And actually, if you press start, unlike Super Mario World, if you press start and you actually play the game, that is the level that you first start out on. Let's pause it. We'll come back to it in a minute. So that's the first thing it did that was very interesting. The other thing that's worth mentioning about Super Mario Brothers that's very interesting is that it's a very small game. It is 40 kilobytes in size. 40 kilobytes. That's smaller than most emails that you send on a daily basis around the office. This picture of the box of Super Mario Brothers is four times as large as Super Mario Brothers the game. So in producing something where every bite counts, you come up with solutions to save space and memory. Who here has ever noticed that the clouds and the bushes are the same graphic? A few of you. That's pretty good. But I can tell you that I was about 35 when I noticed that. <laughs> and I won't say what I said when I noticed, but it was a rude word. I was like, Bruh. Um, So it's a very interesting thing. You know, every bite counts. Optimization is really, really important when you're only working in that amount of space. The other thing that Super Mario Brothers did that was very different, I think, especially to games around the time when it came out, was the way it approached the, the teaching of the player. How do you teach the player how to play the game? How do you approach training? How do you get people engrossed and interested in playing the title? And what's really interesting about the first level in Super Mario Brothers is just how well it teaches you without you realizing you're being taught. You call it stealth teaching. But let's think about the opening screen. This is the opening screen to Mario. This is the first screen you see when you press start. What do you see on the screen? It's nothing. <laughs> it's empty. Even that is, is the thinking behind this game is so clever. Even that is part of the training process. The first screen that you enter, there's nothing there. There's no danger. It's a play box. It's a sandbox. It's somewhere to exp experiment. If you stand still and you're not aware of the timer counting down killing you, you won't die until the timer runs out. No enemies will appear if you stay still on this screen. It's literally just a static empty space for you to practice jumping around as the character. 
is very, very interesting. That is something else that I don't really think any games at the time had done. So if we look at the actual layout of Super Mario, and thanks a lot to the site where I downloaded this, which is, um, let me just give him some cred, because ianalbert.com. Um, it's a wonderful website with all the maps to Mario on, it's very useful. But as you can see, the way that Mario works is it's blocked out into a series of, of, of grids, right? Because it's a tile-based graphic system. Each screen, if we can call them screens because it's a scrolling game, is made up of 16 blocks across, right? So this is the first screen, second screen, third screen, on and on, right? And what's interesting when you start breaking the game up in this way is you can really see how they've laid out the level in order to challenge you, but slowly and not in a frustrating manner, right? If we run straight into that Goomba, we die. But then we remember that the Goomba's there and we avoid it. You can see opportunities for power-ups, and I'm going to go into a lot more detail on this as we scroll through the level. But you can also see challenge increasing over time. The obstacles that you're facing being increased in size, the gaps between them changing, right? But you can also see challenge being implemented in the way that they introduce monsters into the level or things that might kill you. Challenge increasing in terms of the drop that you might encounter on the bottom of the screen, chances to fail, and then the end. But let's go into a bit more detail because we can. <laughs> it's the power of tech. So let's take a look at it zoomed in. So this is the second screen. And what you can see on the second screen is there's an opportunity to get a mushroom power up right on the second screen. So they literally give you the power up straight away. There's no waiting, there's no challenge. They're just like, hey, it'll be pretty fun if you can get big as Mario and experience that. Let's just give it to them straight away. There's no delay. Uh, you've got breakable bricks. What's the point of the breakable bricks in the first level of Mario? There's essentially no point. It's just about having fun. You break them, they're gone. But it's kind of satisfying, it's kind of lovely. The first instance of danger in the game is a slow-moving Goomba, or as Shigeru Miyamoto called it, conceptually, a poisonous mushroom. <laughs> it's the opposite of the mushroom, it kills you and it moves along the ground slowly. You've also got things like this gradual increase in pipe height in order to encourage the player to navigate objects successfully. And then you have things like the game introducing enemies to a time to increase the difficulty between objects. I've thought a lot about Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> so as you can see, this all happens on screens two, three, and four of the first level and shows an enormous amount of thought went into balancing the first level for new players. If we scroll forward. Another thing that the game does very well is a gradual introduction of peril, you know, like, you know more ways to die. So if we look here, there's an Easter egg, there's a hidden block that you can go and tell your friends at school about when you find, which actually happened. There's drops, so instant death. But notice how the drop here is smaller than the drop here. The challenge has increased screen to screen. Then you've got tempting power-ups that force you to go and try and collect something whilst introduc introducing you to the concept of death from above. You've also got evil little snidey tricks like this, where they put a multi-coin box right in the path of two incoming Goombas. Also, another thing that's worth mentioning is they constantly give you opportunities to pick up power-ups and to upgrade your character through the level. So even if you got hit and became small, there'd be another chance to be big and experience the fun of being big and smashing blocks again. If you're already big, it rewards you with another power-up, which is the ability to fire on enemies. At this point, it's worth noting that there's quite a lot going on in level 1-1 one, one of Super Mario Brothers. This area makes up screens 4, 5, and 6 of the level. So if we move back a little bit, opportunities to have more fun are all over this level. So for example here, the game introduces you to the concept of an invincibility star, a superstar. And then it gives you several options for how you might use that ability to get through the level. So you can see here, it's, there's multiple options for different activities. You could jump on the keeper's head and then run after the shell into these animals and watch them all die in a row. 
Or you could get the star power up and run through and be invincible and experience another way of getting through the level and another form of fun. The Keeper introduced here as an alternative enemy, so the game rewards your progress with new content as you go through it. And you can see this happening further into Super Mario Brothers with the introduction of new castles and new worlds. So every time you get to the end, it says, well done, you've rescued the princess, and then says, oh, actually, there's a whole other world coming. So it's probably one of the earliest examples of, of player rewards, you know, and extra content that exists in gaming. So there's a triple purpose to these enemies. You can give them a combo attack, a shell kick, or run, them, run through them with superstar invincibility. So as we move forward, here's another example, and this is something Miyamoto has talked about in many interviews, is the idea of giving players the opportunity to fail without consequence, right? So in this level, there's a really great example here. Sorry, I'll go back. A really great example here of the game giving you a chance to jump over some blocks, but then saving you, and then immediately afterwards giving you the exact same or very similar challenge and dropping you to your death. It's all about the ethos of fun and fairness, which is another thing you see a lot in Super Mario Brothers. And as we get to the end, uh, it's worth mentioning that if you want, if you're an expert player, you can completely avoid all of the challenges and training elements of this level by just using the bonus room that it gives you access to at the start of the level. One of the things that's worth mentioning about Mario as well is that it's very hard to explain what it was like as a very young person playing this game for the first time because we didn't know this stuff. When, when I first got Super Mario Brothers and my mate first got Super Mario Brothers, we didn't, we didn't read the manual. We didn't even know you could go down pipes. You wouldn't believe the, the excitement at school the next day when someone realized there was a pipe on the first level that dropped you into a bonus room that meant you could skip it all. Or running along the roof in level one, two. Right? None of that stuff was stuff that we knew. We discovered it as part of the process of playing the game. And none of those things are accidental. They're done by design. The thought went into it and the planning was there. You can see it in the layout of this level. So another thing that's worth talking about with Super Mario Brothers is control. So if Quang jumps on to uh, play the game here, I've just paused it. There you go. So while Quang's playing it, okay. Let's talk about control, the way that Mario plays, okay? There are lots of things about Mario that made it different to other platformers of the time, especially the way that the character jumps and the control you have with the character in the air. You can move the character around, you can move and jump backwards, there's all sorts of things you can do. Do running jumps, small jumps, quick press jumps that go a different height. And then there's also the fact that there's bonus rooms and other content to unlock and find along the way. The other thing that's really important that we mentioned earlier about Mario is that the character has weight. You can feel the character coming back to the ground. As you run along, you can feel the character coming to a gradual stop. And this is another thing that I need to mention. It's probably the first game of the cutscene. What's that? It's a cutscene. What purpose does this serve in the gameplay, really? It's a cutscene. It's transitioning from one scene to another and explaining where the character's going. And again, that's something that other games at the time didn't really do. There weren't many static screens of animation you know, showing the transition between one state and another. The other thing the game did that was very clever as well was it really made you feel a sense of depth. You realize at this point that you're underground, yeah? It's very, very obvious to you. And that you've dropped from above. Great. Going back. But you can't talk about Super Mario Brothers without talking about the music and the sound effects. How many people in here play Super Mario Brothers or have played Super Mario Brothers with the sound muted? One person, two people, okay. <laughs> I've never ever played it with a sound muted. I'm sure I've muted sound on many other titles. I shouldn't say that being a sound and music person. But 
you know, it's, it's one of those strange things when you talk to people, most of the time they're like, huh, mute it, it's great, love that music. And the sound as well is very, very interesting. Even the fact that when you pick up a coin, it congratulates you. It's almost like the game is saying, well done, well done, every time you pick up a coin, it's absolutely fantastic. And again, it comes back to the idea of the repetition of certain elements of the game, the repetition of breaking blocks, the repetition of jumping on characters' heads and collecting coins, and the sound complementing that makes the game way more pleasurable to play, especially as a young person who absorbs information very quickly. <laughs> and especially the sound of the coin collection is just a very iconic piece of history for gaming. How are we doing for time? Great. That's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Great, cheers. Awesome. Are there questions? Does anyone have any questions? I've got an addition. Go on, go, go, go. Uh, Wait, let me record it so I'll pick it up. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the positioning of the first enemy in yeah. the level was designed to bump you up into the bricks in case yeah. you didn't know that you could hit them from there. Oh, yeah, so it's part of the training of the level. So again, like I said, this, this game has, is the amount of thought that went into this one level. But then when you go to level one, two, so you go to the underground level, you can run across the top, right? Again, that level's teaching you all sorts of things about the game too. And the training continues, and it's all part of the stealth tactics of the game designers. Very clever. Any other questions? Well, might be another addition. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the cutscene might also serve as you can actually go into pipes. So if yeah. you play the first level again, you might actually check... That's a very, level. very good point as well. Any other questions? You also <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting. But the thing is, this as well illustrates how important it is sometimes to go back and look at where games have come from in order to understand perhaps how to do things a little better with our modern take on gaming, okay? This game you could give to a five-year-old child and they could pick it up and enjoy it very, very quickly. There are two buttons, right, in terms of action buttons, and there are four directions. That's it. All right, there's a pause button. <laughs> But the way that it implements these things and the way that it played with its limitations is something we can all learn a lot of stuff from. Um, in my opening bit, when you can't, uh, when you said this playground, like it also shows you that you can't go left. Yeah, you hit the wall and it won't let you scroll that way. So again, it's, it's part of the training. Yeah, so I think it was uh, Miyamoto who said this as well, but um, he's, I, I think it might have been a, another talk. Hmm. But he said, um, you should always design your first level last. Yeah. What's your stance on that? Yeah. And that's a very good tip because the thing is, the first level is the one that you, you should really spend the most amount of time on, right? And you should offer it the same, the, the most amount of polish. Uh, often though, you can have problems when you do that. There's many games that people could probably mention in here where the first level is very, very impressive and subsequent levels are very, very drab especially in the background department back in the retro gaming days, often the first level would be super impressive and you go like, wow, and then you get further into the game and it's just a black background in the level, <laughs> background graphics. Uh, I won't say which games. Any other questions? No? Brilliant. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers.